you will laugh again. It's not going to be this horrible, deadly, boring, dull existence without booze. I have found laughter, again, in a way that I never thought possible. So it will happen. It just takes time. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. On today's episode of the Share Podcast, we have Dana Bowman joining us on the show. She's the author of Bottled, A Woman's Guide to Early Recovery. Dana's absolutely hysterical. I I so much enjoyed interviewing her, and her story is very reminiscent to anyone who has seen When a Man Loves a Woman with Andy Garcia and Meg Ryan. Join us now as Dana takes us through the whole story of alcohol abuse and her inspirational journey into recovery up until today. You absolutely do not want to miss this episode. But first, a message from our sponsor. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www SoberNation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. And if you're looking for more than just one recovery-related podcast, I've got two for you. The Recovery Elevator and That Sober Guy. On Mondays, you have Paul Churchill with the Recovery Elevator podcast. On Tuesdays, you have me, O, with the Share podcast. And on Fridays, you have Shane Raymer with the That Sober Guy podcast. Tune in every week and add us to your recovery portfolio. HP, baby. And after this interview, if you enjoyed listening to the Share Podcast, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. This will ensure we get ranked well on these networks, and that means more people will easily find the Share Podcast. This is the best way to show your support and help us grow. You can also find the Share Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube. Go to any one of your favorite social networks, and the Share Podcast will come right up. And finally, if you would like to make a donation to the Share Podcast, you can do so using PayPal. On the top right corner of the website, you'll see a donate button. Just click on it, and this will take you to the page where you can make your donation. Thanks again for helping the Share Podcast become a huge success. Now back to the show. Hey, Dana, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It's great to have you on the show today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. It's been a good night. There's a storm coming, so I can hear the thunder. I always love nights like this. Oh, that's great. How exciting. Yeah. So, folks, today we have Dana Bowman joining us on the Share Podcast, the author of Bottled, A Woman's Guide to Early Recovery. And real quick, the first person to email me at o at com gets a free copy of Bottled, a mom's guide to early recovery. So go ahead and email me at o at the sharepodcast.com right now, and we will mail you a hard copy of Dana Bowman's book, Bottled, A Mom's Guide to Early Recovery for free. So Dana, let's dive right in. Tell us about how your life is today, your hobbies, exercise. Take us into your normal daily routine, including recovery, and tell us about Bottled, A Mom's Guide to Early Recovery. Okay, well, I usually get up about four o'clock, I nail out a 10 miler and then you go, go have a smoothie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> I'm not, that's not me. No, I get up, I get my kids off to school. Um, nothing too exciting. Um, and I do have two little ones. So there, we just walk down the street to the school that they attend. And then I jump right into my writing. That's what I do in the mornings. I'm a freelance writer. So I, uh, try to get a little bit of time in on reflection and prayer and then get some coffee injected into my system and write. Um, I do love to run, so that's something I do, do but I, I don't do 10 miles a day. <laughs> I, mean, I think the most, like when I first got sober, I did, you know, I did what a lot of people do. is like, I'm going to go run a marathon, you know, and I did a half marathon, which was enough for me. And I really loved it and it rocked. Um, and I have not done one since. <laughs> so I keep 
thinking I will, but um, I just go putter about. I rock, you know, take my dog and we go on a run. But my day is pretty open since I now have two little ones off in school and then I'm just writing. Um, so generally speaking, I kind of have the day to go and do my thing, get my deadlines in, work on stuff. And as far as <laughs> beginning and ending my day, this might sound familiar, but I just make sure the first thing I do when I wake up is I think, say thanks. I always say thank you when I wake up because for, for some reason, and I just say it like out loud, it's kind of weird. <laughs> if my husband's there, he's like, you're welcome. I know that sounds weird, but I, I have learned that I, um, my mornings can be kind of a downtime for me, a, a depressed time. And so I say thank you kind of up to the my higher power. And then I do the same thing at night when I fall asleep. I say thank you. And that's my way of kind of beginning and ending my day. And it sort of helps bring me back to the whole point of it all, which is just, you know, gratitude, that kind of thing. Um, the book bottled and it's it's actually a mom's guide but it, it is a woman's we, we, we moms we are women so there you go um it's mom's guide to early recovery i wrote it um within a nine month period so it's literally my third child and i i had a i had an article got that got picked up and kind of went viral off of um i used to write for substance.com which sadly is no longer and was a great website for recovery and articles. I loved writing for them. Um, so one of the first articles I wrote for them was about parenting and how do you talk to your kids about this lovely topic of being in recovery. And it went viral and HuffPost picked it up. Then I got interviewed and all this. So Central Recovery Press, which is the publication company, they contacted me and said, would you write a book for us, which is very honoring and cool, um, very rare. <laughs> and uh, so I, I just dove right in and wrote the book and now it's out and everybody in my small town is reading it and it's freaking me out <laughs> it was awesome but I, I literally sat through like a whole half an hour discussion with this editor that was all very formal and polished and we talked like we both I at least I talked like I knew what I was talking about which I didn't and then finally at the very end I go wait a minute and I'm like okay can I just ask something she just she goes, yeah, I go, is this for real? Are you, like, punking me in the... <laughs> is there a camera in my house right now? Like, there's a show punked for writers. <laughs> like, really? Do you really think... Um, so, at any rate, it was amazing. It was just a whirlwind. And uh, now it's out, and it's doing really well. So, it uh, seems to be striking a chord with mommies. Wow. So, you wrote for the Huffington Post? Yeah, I got that. The, the article got picked up by them. I, and then they ran it and ran the interview that I did, then ran a couple other articles. And I've written for some other publications that are recovery-related and some parenting stuff, too. So Wow, that's fantastic. Hey, I want you to send me that link, the one to the Huffington Post, so I can put it in your show notes uh, so that the listeners can find it. And now moving forward, Dina, how do you maintain your spiritual condition, that conscious contact with a higher power? Well, part of it is kind of what I said that initially, I just try really hard to be aware that my higher power is with me at all times. And I, I know um, for those of us that struggle with the concept of a higher power, here's my quick story, okay? I was raised in a Baptist home. I had the love of Jesus beaten into me <laughs> since oh. I was little. And, um, you know, that sounds bad, but it, it was just, it wasn't really a relationship by any means. And then when I came into recovery, that's when my relationship with my higher power took off. And it, it became something that was real and personal, intimate and amazing. Um, so I have to kind of work at it, though, because I, I kind of see it as like a, I don't know, before before recovery, I kind of viewed God as like I, we were online dating. Like we <laughs> would like talk to each other and I'd tell him all the good stuff about me and he would like tell me all the great stuff about me back and then that was it. And so, and then a lot, there was long silences too, <laughs> which happens when you online date. <laughs> I'm saying this like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh my God, you're killing me. <laughs> it was, it was an awkward relationship at best. And so then finally when recovery happened and I, I went into a 12 step meeting and I'll never forget that feeling. And it, it sounds kind of spiritual and w you know, wacky, but it was for real. I had this moment of realization that my higher power was with me right then and it was so, like, I don't know how to explain it, but I just felt like I had loyalty for the first time in my life. I had true loyalty. And, like, this this relationship, this power, this being that's going to look over me and watch over me, he is for me in all ways. So 
that was really an amazing thing. But then I realized, you know, if I'm going to maintain this relationship, we need to like kind of get serious about each other and no longer <laughs> online date. Um, so I just, I read every day. I make sure that I'm in, um, I like, you know, I do some daily reflection. I try to read the big book as often as I can. That book is an amazing book to me because you can literally just do that whole like weird, like I've had a crap day and I'm just going to put my finger in the book, like wham and open it. And wherever I open it, I know it just, just like it speaks straight to me. So it's, it's kind of cool. I do try to journal. I say that now kind of with tongue in cheek because I haven't had the time to journal as much as I would like, but that's usually my way of kind of praying. And a lot of times I just kind of talk to my higher power all the time out loud. My kids think I'm nuts. Um, people just driving probably think I'm nuts, but I don't care. So, um, I just, I just need to maintain contact with him at all times. And it was one of those things that I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but when my brother died, um, from alcohol abuse, I had to speak at his funeral, which is the worst. And I just remembered saying that to me, the one thing I could take from this death that I could maybe, I guess, benefit from was that it taught me who we need to lean on and why, and that we need to maintain a conscious contact with our higher power at all time. I, uh, I try to have a space for it. Like that was something I learned just maybe in the last six months or so. I had a friend who talked to me about getting on your knees and all that. And I just really thought that was kind of like, "Mm, I don't think so. My (laughs) knees hurt. I don't want to do that. And then, and then have a space, like a prayer space, you know, even like a, just a a place that's dedicated to putting up your prayers on the wall and no distraction and all that. And I really worked on that and it has helped a lot to have that place where um, my kids know when I go in there and I shut the door, they're like, Ooh, something big's going down. So we stay out. And then, uh, you know, and we try, I try to maintain kind of that place, but then at the same time I do just kind of wander around and talk to God wherever. So. And now tell us how much clean time do you have and when is your anniversary date? Okay. So this is the weird part. I had to actually go back and look it up because I had forgotten the actual date. Um, but it was May 8th, 2011. That was the actual day. So four years or so. And I'm, happy to say it's just been a completely huge turnaround since that time. When I grew up, I had a dad who's in recovery now, and he was really early in recovery when I was little. Like, I think he got sober when I was two or three. And so I grew up around meetings. We had meetings in our basement. This is back when everybody smoked. And I can remember (laughs) I had to go down and do this, like, clean out the ashtrays. I was always (laughs) And my dad never really explained kind of what the meetings were. I just knew that we had to be really quiet. And then afterwards, I cleaned out the ashtrays. So I, I learned, you know, kind of what the drill was with the, with the 12-step recovery meeting thing. Um, and then, of course, I thought, you know, back before I thought I had a problem, I'm like, those things suck. I will never go to one of those. That's just for old dudes that smoke. And then, of course, the first day of my recovery, for some reason, the keys were in my hand. I, had, I was like on autopilot that day. I was, first of all, I was so hungover that I could barely function. But I got my keys. I got online. I found a meeting. And I just drove to one because I, I really literally, I don't know how to explain it. I was so freaking terrified of living without alcohol that I could not comprehend doing it. And I knew, and I was so freaking terrified to go to a meeting. Like that was just terror, you know, terrifying in itself. But for some reason, the terrifying part of not drinking again, won, and I went to that meeting. And, um, um, so from there on out, I, I have 10, 12 meetings, 12 suppers. I have a sponsor. I've been trying to get a sponsee, but no one will take me. <laughs> I'm, they don't want me. Um, which is probably good. I'm still a little early in the game. So, and I really find, um, I have all different kinds of meetings I go to. I go to speaker meetings, I like book studies, things like that. Um, then I also do a ton of reading. It kind of comes to the territory since I'm a writer and an English teacher. So I would assume read and read and read on recovery as much as I can. And then I just, um, talk incessantly at my 12 step (laughs) meetings until they want me to shut up. That's my routine. And, um, and you know what else? It's really neat is that my dad and I now talk about recovery all the time. And it's almost, I mean, we, we email a lot now and we talk a lot. Again, 
the death of my brother kind of brought that out in us. We we all as a family decided we were not going to bullshit each other anymore, and we were just going to talk for real. And so I get the best recovery advice from him ever. I mean, he's he's been in recovery for over 50 years now, so it's mm, like... Oh, my God. That okay. is just oh. amazing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, man. Dana, you're all warmed up here, so it's time for me to turn this show over to you. It's time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life when you hit rock bottom, and finally, your journey into recovery up until today. So, Dana, take it away. Thank you. Um well, it's kind of an interesting story in the sense that it's not necessarily the typical story in terms of um, a hard party and girl. Um, I grew up in the burbs. I had, you know, my mom and dad are still married. Life um, was pretty simple and pretty good. Yes, I had a father in, who was in recovery, and there was some issues with that. Um, but he wasn't drinking. And I, I like I said, I, I really kind of lived this um, life where that – you know, that was going on around me, those meetings and things like that. So, you know, I, I look back on that a lot of times and kind of go, huh, why did it, you know, why did I end up like this if, if I kind of had it normal? But you know what? I don't need to worry about that <laughs> or think about it or try to figure it out because I am what I am and it's okay. Um, so at, at any rate, I, I went, I didn't really drink and party that much at all, even through college. I drank in college, um, but I wasn't blacking out, I wasn't going crazy. I even have a, a chapter in the book called I Never Danced on Tables, and it was sort of like my, like, why did I not, if I'm not <laughs> and I can't drink anymore, why did I not, like, go crazy and just, you know, dance on tables, coyote ugly it, like, couldn't I have done something crazy? Um, but no, I didn't. I just was always totally into maintaining control and looking okay on the outside, so... Um, so yeah, I drank through college in my twenties, um, in my thirties and that's when kind of later on in my thirties, um, I'd had a couple relationships go really south. I was one of those hanger honors. I, I had two really serious relationships in my life prior to my husband. And these were like eight year long. I love you so much. I'm going to die without you. Codependently just ugh, off the charts. <laughs> and of course, uh, both of those didn't go well. So, you know, usually when you're a codependent, your relationships don't go well. It's just shocking how that works out. And I, I found myself really leaning on alcohol to help with that at the time, um, both times. And I found myself also really, really wanting to be on the outside, what everyone would call totally together with it. Cool, sophisticated. This girl has it all. Like, I bought my own house at... I think I was 28 years old. I was one of the first. I had a really great job. I got, you know, I, I had accolades up the wazoo on everything that I did. And that that pressure to maintain that life um, resulted in more and more going home, having a glass of wine, having two glasses of wine. Um, the thing is, though, is that I picked my alcohol carefully back then. I really got into, like, uh, wine tastings and fancy schmancy bottles and I even went to Europe and had like the whole wine thing there and it was also very sophisticated and okay because you know just tasting and liking it for the taste that's it when in actuality really I could have cared less like you could have given me boons and I would have been <laughs> guzzling it to no end and, uh, only yeah. addicts and alcoholics know what boons hill is oh boons yes <laughs> Oh, man. So at any rate, I, um, gosh, booze was just crap, too. And I still, I mean, really, just at that point in my life, I was making martinis. I had, like, the whole shaker thing. And I don't want to go on and on about that because that's when all the alcoholics start listening. They're like, oh, yeah. like, <laughs> I, But I really had this down, like, this whole per picture and persona, kind of the mad men thing going on where I just really wanted to give off this vibe of, I am totally comfortable in my skin. I am totally sophisticated. Look at me. Um, I have the world by its string. And so Martini in one hand, you know, just really hoped to give off this vibe. Whereas inside, um, with the death of both of those relationships and just other things, anxiety, depression, that I was starting to realize we're not going away. 
Um, I really, really started to lean on that alcohol just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more every day. And that added up to every month. And then, you know, slowly, it was one of those things where alcohol just kind of waited for me. He was very patient and he waited. Um, but again, like this is the tricky part because there were no huge red flags. I wasn't getting arrested. I wasn't blacking out and I definitely wasn't puking because I hate puking and so I really was so on top of it and just I mean I was making my own martinis with vermouth and all this stuff if you have to make a drink that involves like 12 steps you're not an alcoholic <laughs> it takes too long like to make the damn drink so you can't be right and so at any rate I just kept at that and kept at that um, and now here's the hard part because it just sounds like I'm laying blame but so then I get married and I love my husband to death. We have that lovely first year of marriage that is so hard. It's, it is for everybody. Um, we're adjusting to each other. I didn't get married until I was 36. He was 37. We were set in our ways. And so we had this year of just turmoil. Plus, I had moved. Plus, I had to start a new job. I just had all these things going on that were kind of crumbling away at me. And when I look back on it now, I kind of feel like it was... My higher power was like, hmm, okay, deck of cards you have made this house of cards with, and it's huge. And I am just going to slowly start taking things away until you fall. He, I think he really wanted me to just collapse because there was no other way that I was going to quit drinking. At this point, if I go back, I could find my journals, and it gave me chills to find them. Even in my early married years and maybe a little bit prior about every oh I don't know two or three months or so there's an entry that says I poured out all the alcohol last night I gotta stop drinking so I was already saying it I already knew or I was gonna like just drink on the weekends or just you know start to play with the the rules Mm -hmm. right yeah and um so marriage was really stressful and there were some red flags at that point because we lived in a college town and we just pretty much partied that first year and um and you know kind of had the long honeymoon thing but there were times when there were some fights and some things happened where I was like it's just off and but I play, I I played the blame game and I blamed it all on my husband and just thought it was because of him and that wasn't the case so then we moved again and then bam I had children and <laughs> The poor little babies, oh my gosh, they take like the top of your head and just rip it off. They're just crazy little things. And um, I had postpartum, I had terrible anxiety and depression with them both. In fact, that was one of the first articles that I had written about that um, that made it into like a larger publication. I was so excited. And then later when I went back and read it, I thought, after recovery, I went back and read it. And I was like, Dana you idiot like the whole reason you're dealing with the postpartum is probably because you're a freaking alcoholic and you're you're thinking of drinking all the time and I I couldn't I wasn't drinking while I was pregnant um, but I did really miss it and to the point where I mean that's like saying you know I really miss oxygen like I was thinking about it all the time when I was pregnant and then, and I don't know at all if this is going to make any sense, probably not, because you're not female, but when I had Give it a shot. and I started <laughs> nursing, I was doing the whole pump and dump game where I was trying to figure out, like, how can I nurse my baby and still have a glass of wine? Now, I wasn't pounding it, and I totally um, did not drink on a daily basis back when I was nursing, but I could tell already that I was starting to play the mind games with the, with the alcohol and starting to rationalize and just really sad and pathetic stuff it's hard to admit that but the only reason I can admit it now is that I have to I have to because well first of all it's in the book but secondly (laughs) if I don't get honest and just say what really happened and try to gloss over now then I'm just playing the same crap games that you know I did back with then so um so as my children are growing I've got like uh you know a newborn and then I have two we had children really close together right like we were older, so I thought, huh, I'm older. It'll take me a while to get pregnant. Ha! Huh. Like, <laughs> And boom, I have Charlie. And then literally 18 months later, I have Henry almost to the day. And wow. I'm seriously freaking out because I have two babies, um, like 18 months and young. And I, I think I'm going to just lose my freaking mind. And 
I was in a job that I loved. I no longer had that job. I was staying home because I had martyred myself to that and decided I'll stay home, which really I didn't want to do, honestly. Um, it ended up being, actually, that ended up being a good thing. And I look on it now, and I'm glad that I'm doing that now. But at the time, I was crazy. Um, and I just found myself longing for that 4 o'clock hour, that 5 o'clock hour, um, all day long, every day. And then before I know it, I mean, after all these years and all this time had passed, slowly but surely, I came up to a point where I was drinking a bottle of wine a day. Like, that's that's what I got. Two bottles, actually. A bottle was not even enough. And I would add vodka. Sometimes I, when I was really dumb, I would mix vodka with wine. Like, who does that? Like, why? <laughs> I don't. I don't even know why I did that. I look back on them like, oh man, that's just bad. I think I found some. Um, one day we didn't have any booze in the house, except for like some Cointreau or something. That's that really sweet syrupy something, and that you make margaritas with. And I just remember finding that and just guzzling it, <laughs> just finding myself going, "Wow, this might have this might, might be a bit of a problem here." But oh no no, and so. Somehow or another, the the record started playing a different tune, and that's when I got it. Like I realized, all of a sudden, bamo, I have a problem. And and uh, to back up just a little bit, I've had some at this point. I've had some pretty colossal fights with the husband. The husband has said, "You have a problem." And getting the booze out of the house, he's he did that at least twice. Um, both times, I found the booze, snuck it back in, um, all totally like thinking that I was normal and this was okay to like hide booze in my boots in the closet. Like that's normal. Um, I also <laughs> hid it in the laundry room. I hid it all over the house and I thought that somehow this is was normal. It, this is totally when a man loves a woman. I'm, I'm, yes. picturing, I'm totally it picturing this. Does. It's yeah. totally. And I mean, it, at the time you just kind of, lose your mind yeah. and I'm a very intelligent woman with a pretty good brain I guess but I really lost my mind and, and um, anyhow so th that being said there was a point and I'll never forget it I was sitting upstairs in our kids playroom and my two boys were playing and they're little and adorable and I'm just sitting there and I just want to die and I just literally knew I, I don't know how to put it except that this feeling of dread came over me and I realized one that I couldn't stop drinking. I was an alcoholic. And two, I didn't care. I wasn't going to stop. Like, I just, that's the part that really got me was the feeling of, well, okay, so now I'm going to learn how to manage my alcoholism. Because mm -hmm. I've controlled everything else. So I'm going to be an alcoholic. Fine. I can do alcoholic. I, I've done everything else. You know, I have the great job. I've done the great house. I've done the cute kids. I, geez, I can do alcoholism. And, Nope, you can't. So at some point, I'm starting to have pains in my lower back. I'm starting to not eat. Um, things are really starting to look south physically. But it was more than that for me. And a lot of times people will talk about how, you know, I'm so glad I'm a, I don't have the hangovers anymore. And I hear that. And I always think, yeah, and that was the case with me too. But for me, it was more of this this huge weight of dread. I woke up every morning just dreading living. And just even answering the door was a horrible exercise in um, fear and panic. I had agoraphobia. Like, it was just, oh, I couldn't even leave my house barely. And I had to because I was teaching and, oh, I had, I'd gotten a teaching job at the college. So here I was, super professor girl you know, and trying to look all okay on the outside. And uh, it wasn't the case. It was, it was a total ruse. So I would maintain this whole, like, perfect teacher mom persona for maybe up to an hour or two a day to go out into the world, right? Mm -hmm. But it would, it would just fry me so bad that I had to drink when I got back. Like, I had to because I deserved it because... And I explain this too, I think, in the book where it was this, this horrible but unbalanced teeter-totter of super mom, like, let's do something with glitter and make a craft together, kids, and it's going to be great. And then I do that for about a half an hour and want to kill myself because um, it's glitter. 
And you don't, you know, and I had to be perfect mom and all that. And then I would drink. So I would seesaw back and forth between pathetic loser, drunk mom and super, you know, super mom. And you can't do that for very long before, you know, something's going to go. And so I decided (laughs) intelligently enough that, okay, I'm going to quit drinking. And, um, and I describe this at length in the book, so I will try to sum it up. Where I, I did the, the I'm going to quit, but I'll, I'm going to have one last weekend, okay? Oh, last the weekend. famous last weekend. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like no other alcohol. No one can relate to this. <laughs> and so I went out and I bought all my favorite, you know, things, expensive wines, which for me back then were like $12. <laughs> 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 God. Again, I can relate. <laughs> God bless me. When I found boxed wine that was actually somewhat good, and I was like, it was like the holy freaking grail. I'm like, oh, boxed wine. Uh, but at any rate, um, so I go out and I buy all this stuff, and it's Thursday, and I'll just never forget. I decided I was just going to party my little butt off and somehow um, get it past the kids and you know the husband and all that, and then I would get sober on Monday morning. And Friday night, I collapsed onto my kitchen floor and um I couldn't get up and I had one glass of wine at that point that was the first glass of wine I'd had that day and for some reason and I I say this in the book I think my higher power said it's almost like I could hear it he said okay you want to get drunk I'll show you drunk and he just took me out and took me out and I I couldn't even talk I could barely walk I couldn't walk I had to crawl to find my phone um, and I called my husband and he came home uh, miraculously and I always have to add this to his benefit. My husband is the slowest person on the planet. He is a sweet, sweet guy but it takes him like four times as long to do anything and so I figured by the time I called him it would be like another hour, right? He was home seriously in like 10 minutes and so I don't know how he did it but um, he knew and plus our phone conversation didn't even make any sense. All I think I said was, please come home. And that's it. And look, it was probably not very discernible. Um, Because I asked him later, and he said it wasn't what you said. It was what he said, I just knew I had to get home. And so he felt like he was just literally, he just got up, got his keys, and went out the door. And that was very rare for him. (laughs) And so um, from there on out, I kind of collapsed on him when he got there. And I said, and it, it was such a hopeless, it, it just makes me sad just to remember how sad I was. I said, I can't quit drinking. And I can't quit drinking, but I can't keep living like this. And so I literally was looking at him like, I'm, I'm just going to die. Like, I, I don't know what else to do. I can't quit drinking, but I can't keep drinking, you know? And, um, and then something kind of went into place with that telling of him. It was like, I don't know what it was. Some sort of calm kind of came down to me. I went to bed. Um, I woke up the next day feeling horrible. And then, like I said, for some reason, I just kind of started just robotically. I got the keys. I got a shower. I got dressed. I kind of did that all backwards. I got the keys last. Um, And then I, sorry, I'm a writer. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Um, And so I got in the car. I don't remember remember driving there. I think I cried the whole time. Then I went into the meeting. I cried in the meeting. It was awful. And then I left. And I I will never forget. It was the most terrifying experience. The meeting part. Um, a lot of women especially will say, I don't want to go to meetings. They're scary. And then I tell the story and I hope it doesn't turn people off because it was. It was like all trucker dudes. <laughs> tattoos. Not a lot of teeth. <laughs> I mean, this one guy had a, a skull tattoo of a spider web on his skull. Yeah. And I'm like sitting in there in my pink, you know, <laughs> Victoria's Secret sweatsuit thing, right? Like, so little housewife with these dudes that have like, and it's, I mean, the, there's no smoking anymore in these meetings, but the, the, the walls are just like yellowed from smoke and it is just grimy and dreary and I'm thinking this is not for me oh my god I'm gonna die (laughs) and then this one dude starts talking and I mean seriously he's like the farthest from me on the planet in terms of like 
I don't know, it just we were not in the same social circles, okay? And he starts to talk, and I exhale, like, oh, my God, like, th- these are big people. <laughs> and I breathed for probably the first time in 20 freaking years. Like, I had this moment of, this is where I belong. And I, it still brings tears to my eyes because I just felt like, finally, 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 there's something about listening to these people talk. I don't care where... Where I am or what meeting I'm in, it is still, uh, it just gives me such peace. Um, and that's not to say that every meeting is this wonderful experience because, you know, there's always, people are people and, and they can also be, you know, people are a pain sometimes and that's okay. And the, But for the most part, um, that process of getting to a 12-step meeting for me was integral. Um, And there, and there you go. And then I just started on the journey. Wow. Um, I did not have rehab. I did not get to, I was not told 90 and 90, although I did attempt 90 and 90 and I got pretty close. Um, I was really blessed with a husband that was really super supportive so I could leave the kids. And I know a lot of moms are not in that place or single moms, especially like, I can't go to 90 and I, you know, that's crazy. Right. Um, but I do, I do remember being told this and I still kind of stick with it. Um, if you want it enough, I feel like if you're going to try, and I've said this before, um, I don't know where I've said it, so I hope I don't sound like I'm being repetitive, but if you feel like if you're going to try and do something for yourself that the universe is going to say yes to like this good and holy and righteous and pure thing. Okay. You're going to get clean. That's like the, I think, in the terms of living right, that's probably one of the best things anybody could do for themselves. And I think the universe will respond. I really do. <laughs> I think you'll get yourself to a freaking meeting. Um, and so sometimes I think moms use that, the kids, as an excuse. I know I did at times. When I was tired and want to go, I'd be like, well, Charlie has a cough, you know, and pull that angle. Um, but I really do feel like, Get thee to a meeting is is probably um, easier than we sometimes like to think. So, anyhow, that's my story. <laughs> oh, Dana. Well, you have such a great story. It's so funny. Seriously, you should be doing stand-up. Um, but, man, I totally can relate. I remember when I first started going to meetings here in Costa Rica... Uh, it was me in a room with a bunch of fat old guys that I had nothing in common with, and they were gruff, you know, they were politically incorrect, and women would come into the meetings, and they might make it through the whole meeting, and they would never come back. So it took a long time before women actually started to stay. And what happened was it was a, a couple of lesbians that started showing up, and they didn't give a shit about these old guys. So they, they just kept coming back. And then as other women started to gravitate to the meetings, they started to stay. And it was just such a beautiful transition to watch. I think that's what's the most important part about being in recovery is that recognizing that these rooms are sacred. We need to make everyone feel safe and welcome. Yeah, yeah. it means a lot. I mean, and the meeting I go to now, I'm usually one of the few women that attend. And most of it is it's a smaller group with a lot of gruff guys, um, which makes me laugh because some of them are going to listen to this and be like, what do you mean? So, um, but they're just, I call them the geezer patrol. Like a lot of them are older, gruff, you know, and, um, now that doesn't bother me so much, but, um, that first meeting was absolutely terrifying. And then I had to, I didn't keep going to that one cause it really just wasn't a solid fit at all. And I, I did have to keep kind of looking around and I was blessed to be in an area that had a lot of meetings around. Um, and so what I ended up doing is I stuck with, you know, just kind of going to a different one, which means basically I was terrified. I, I still look back on this. I am a horrible coward. Like I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of, uh, small places. I'm afraid of everything. And yet here I was like, I don't know how I did it. I look back and I think what was going on where I would go get the keys and try a new meeting with scary tattooed toothless people until <laughs> I found the one that was right. And it actually had a few women in there that I'm still, one of them was my now sponsor and I will never forget it when I walked in and then I was like, okay, now I'm really home. But I felt like I was home kind of from the beginning, even though it was pretty, pretty scary and pretty different. So it was a blessing. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just recently I had a female listener with 11 months clean send me an email that she was so upset about how the men in the rooms were being so inappropriate. Uh, Guys would just grab her hand as she would walk in the rooms or say stuff to her after the meetings that was really inappropriate. And she was like, she was pissed off, you know, Um, and she emailed me and, and she said, you know, there's not enough focus on the newcomer, especially women. Anyway, I'm not going to go on a rant here. I think we all get the message. So again, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It was so funny. It was so chocked full of realism and drama. Um, you know, what we go through is so intense and it helps. It's so nice to be able to put a humorous tone on it. Always remembering at the end of the day that we're trying to save lives here. Well, I'm grateful to be able to share it because just, I mean, through the experience of writing this book and sharing, it's been an amazing experience for me. It's been learning for me. It's taught me so much about what sobriety really means and recovery and stuff. So I'm learning too from all of this. It's awesome. I love it. Okay, Dana. Well, let's start closing up now. And the way I like to close up is for the newcomer. So I'm going to ask you five questions about your early recovery and you're going to respond with inspiring and insightful answers you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Wonderful. <laughs> so number one. Okay, Dana, so what was keeping you from getting clean or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? Um, <clears throat> the main thing for me was ego, I think. I had an ego the size of, like, Texas. So I thought <laughs> I was smarter than this. I could figure it out. Um, you know, my dad had lectured me since I was little that I had a 50-50 shot to become an alcoholic and um, one person in my family already was my brother so I was you know it was between me and my sisters and I just really thought I was smarter than all of it and what I have found through this whole process is that I am not I am I am I don't know I'm just grateful that I am where I am and ego doesn't really have any place um, the other part of that played into that was fear, and I was afraid of everything, like I said. Um, I had some major anxiety issues, and fear um, was linked to that. That led to depression. And, you know, It's all like this big tangled web. Um, but for me, uh, learning to face some fear and deal with it, and stare it down, realize what it is, the monster in the closet, um, look at the monster, and you know, maybe even try to pet the monster. It's really not, <laughs> not going to kill me. So that was the main thing, fear and ego. We are egomaniacs with an inferiority complex. Or like my sponsor used to say, we are either the giants of our dreams or we are the dwarfs of our nightmares. Yeah. So we live That's in, good. Yeah, we live in extremes. Yeah, and it, it was pretty miserable, <laughs> to, <laughs> honestly, to live like that, to feel like you have to control the world because you deserve to have this world in perfect place and then realize you can't at all times it's just a constant you know you suck no I don't like <laughs> you suck versus I'm the best and it just never works out that's oh, not good for anybody god I hate having that conversation with oh, myself no. oh it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right so number two at what point did you have a spiritual awakening that aha moment in recovery when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol but for the first time had developed the hope that you could recover? You know, it, for me, it was probably not even at that very beginning when I started going to meetings. At that point, I was still like, I don't want to quit drinking. Maybe I'll try this for a year. I still had all those crazy thoughts. I'll get clean for a year. Like, <laughs> And then uh, um, it was probably about for me, it was always the magic number three. Three weeks in, three months in, six months in, I had these big things happen at around six and nine months that always sort of gave me these like, ha, ah, aha, huge learning things. Um, and about three weeks in, after going into a lot of meetings and finding that one where I felt, you know, I finally fit, I was looking around and they were all laughing. All the people who were at the meeting were laughing and I was really irritated because I felt like, this is serious, people. <laughs> like, we're talking life or death. So why are we laughing? And then I just, I looked at their faces and I thought, and see laughter, if you haven't caught on, laughter to me is really important. I'm, I write funny. My blog's funny. I try to be funny and I, cause I love it. I think it's important. And, um, and I just really felt at that point in my life that as much as I was going to get sober, it was just going to be this long, grim, horrible, 
you know, apocalyptic story of grim, grim despair. And I was looking at them laughing and so joyful. And I got the giggles and I could not stop laughing. And it was almost like to the point where it was embarrassing. And I thought, I'm going to be able to laugh again. Like, and it's going to be real laughter. And I'm finally going to know what that feels like because honestly, I hadn't laughed like that since I was a kid. And um, that moment I, I can even tell you where everybody was sitting in the room like I it just it's like a Polaroid in my head yes. was such a blessing beautiful I love it yes. all right number three do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to a newcomer that you read in early recovery yes I have two um actually I have three the first one is obviously the big book and like I said I just that thing is just such a comfort to me um, I have even found myself falling asleep on it. Like I will just grip it to my chest and just fall asleep because at the, in the early days, because it just felt like a life preserver, really literally. Um, so anyhow, I consumed that sucker. Um, and then there's a book called living sober and it, it's this book that they'll give you that looks like it was written in like 1972 and it, it's really ugly cover. And <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the one I had was really like, really, this looks interesting. And oh my gosh, that book spoke to me in so many ways because what it was literally talking about was the practical nuts and bolts in and outs of how do you deal with getting sober, like at the very beginning, that kind of stuff. And that's kind of what I did with my book because I felt like when I kept reading, I kept trying to find mommy books about drinking that weren't these horribly grim, depressing drunkologues that had like practical advice and I, I couldn't find them. Um, so I, I kind of went back to living sober and thought, okay, that just took me through the stuff, like talked about sugar and it talked about how to deal with, um, you know, have some candy handy, like stuff like that where, I would just sit and read it because it, it just helped me stay sane. And then, okay, and so the third one is Carolyn Knapp's Drinking a Love Story, which it's not from the perspective of a mom, but it is a woman, and it is probably the best. I think she has had one of the first books out there about a woman in recovery. Um, I bought it way back in my 20s, and strangely enough, I had bought all this literature about recovery in my 20s, I uh, just kept it on my shelf for some reason. I was really drawn to it. Hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> and uh, and so I went back and read that after I got sober. I was like, oh, it's so good. And so her book is sort of a lot of women will say in recovery, will be like, oh, yeah, that's like the Bible of women. And What's the title again? It's called Drinking a Love Story. And, and who's the author? I, her name is Caroline Knapp, K-N-A-P-P. Okay. Sadly, she is. She has passed away. Um, but her book, it was just an amazing book. Absolutely, yes. That book gets mentioned quite a bit. It's very popular. A lot of the female guests on the show have mentioned that book and recommended it. And also, listeners, send me an email o at the sharepodcast dot com, and you will receive a free copy of Bottled, A Mom's Guide to Early Recovery. So the first person to email me and say, hey, oh, can I have that book? We'll get a free copy mailed to them. Email him, because it's going to be so pathetic if we do this whole thing, <laughs> and you don't get one email like, I don't want that book. So, <laughs> I just, I need one email. That's all I need. I'm not even worried. We've got quite a few female listeners out there. I've got a pretty good idea of which ones are going to email me right away and request this book for free. So, Dana, what is the best suggestion you have ever received? Uh, I'm going to take it from my dad um, and my sponsor. My sponsor says, do the next right thing to me all the time. Um, I get very mired down in details and future tripping and trying to figure it all out. I still want to control the world. So she just says that, and then I kind of shut up and go, okay, do the next right thing. What would that be? Mm, wash my hands. Okay, I'm going to go wash my hands, and now I'm going to eat an orange. And then I just, for, and then I just kind of forget. Like After that, I'm like, good. Um, and then my dad told me this <laughs> when I got engaged. He gripped, he's really intense, and he gripped me by the elbow, and he's like, I want you to know something about marriage. No expectations. I was like, what? That's the most depressing advice. Like, no expectations. <laughs> Like, you know, this is my knight in shining armor. I need to have some expectations. He's, you know, it's 
It's supposed to save the day. And my dad's like, no, no expectations. Have no expectations. And I have always come back to that. Like, we we need to deal with our own shit. Sorry about the language. And we need to deal with our own life and stop expecting stuff from others. Like, it's just, it's like with Christmas. It never is what you think it's going to be, you know? So <laughs> let it go. And just enjoy the Christmas morning, okay? So no expectations. That's my other one. You know what they say about expectations? They are premeditated resentments. Yes. So, you know, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And and then surprising that your father, who is an alcoholic, is intense. Oh, my God. He's really intense. <laughs> He's so intense. He is the, we call it the Vulcan death grip where he grabs your elbow. <laughs> right? Where if you do it now, there's these two joint the joint if you get the muscles just right it's like you are immobilized completely you can't even move and he did that to us all our lives and uh, i think he's even done it to my husband a couple times and it works so yes yeah, he's amazing all right i love it i love it. i'd love to meet your dad he sounds like an awesome guy oh maybe yeah. i should interview maybe i should interview him oh he would love it my dad is like john wayne slash dennis hopper is the other one yeah kind of crazy John Wayne, I'm totally getting the picture in my mind right now. <laughs> he probably looks nothing like John Wayne. So anyway, all right. So Dana, number five, if you could give a newcomer only one suggestion, what would that be? Um, I guess the main thing I would say is I, I, I got this all the time from an old guy that said, you know, go to meetings. Don't drink in between. I tried to keep it really simple. But the suggestion or the, I guess the word of wisdom I would give is, is that you will laugh again. It's not going to be this horrible, deadly, boring, dull existence without booze. Um, booze was just a symptom for me for some stuff that was underneath. And once I started to deal with the stuff underneath, I have found laughter again in a way that I never thought possible. So it will happen. It just takes time. I concur 100%. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Dana, wow. Again, thank you so much for sharing your experience, strength, and hope with us. Thank you, sir. This is fun. I always enjoy talking about myself. <laughs> My favorite topic. Nobody loves me more than me. <laughs> but I'm glad to share it. It was such a fun thing. You're great. It was fun to share with you. So thanks. So. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's my absolute favorite thing to do in the world. And I also am reminded that I can never have too big of a recovery network. So thank you. And we have now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Thanks, so. Have a good night. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step fellowship as a whole. And though we discuss 12-step recovery and the impact it had in our lives, we do not promote or endorse any 12-step anonymous program.